Right, shall we make a start then? While people are still joining, but uh, you miss a huge amount from my intro. The main thing is the chat with you guys. So welcome and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, this is our retail webinar where we'll be discussing sustainability, innovation, resilience, and the golden quarter. So we're coming up to Christmas, we're getting all excited. Obviously shops are our big thing in life now, whether it be food or for our things for our pets or shoes or whatever that may be. So really excited to start this off. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Sam Vickerman, one of the practice directors from Grace. And for those of you who don't know Grace, um, we work with organisations nationwide to help them harness the power of emerging talent, building capability and delivering excellence across change, data and tech. Really proud to work in partnership with some fantastic organisations. We work across sectors, including retail, and we've got fantastic clients, three of which are here here today. So represented, we've got the co-op group, Mark Hagen, we've got Andrea Mills from Pets at Home, and we've got Will Rose from Hotter Shoes. So really excited to be talking to them today. We've also got one of our wonderful Grace analysts, Susie Mills here, who again is working with our retail clients, and uh, she's going to facilitate the conversation for us today. So thrilled to have you guys on board with us. I'm going to come to the intros, but first, just to set the scene a little bit, really, on, on what this session is about. Um, we all know that retail is going through significant transformation, and I think unprecedented. Um, even before the pandemic, we're seeing a move to different channels of sales, so moving away from shops to many, many different online uh, channels and methods of attracting and selling to customers. So. COVID expedited this massively over the last two years. In addition to this layer on top Brexit, you've got supply chain challenges and logistics, and then you've also got now um, more and more to um, sustainability moving up the agenda. So retail organizations are facing increased pressures to reduce their impact on the environment, including the reduction of waste and also to keep reducing their costs as well. So there are significant challenges facing them. Consumers are increasingly conscious now of how they shop and what they buy. So we're gonna look in at this session really on how these clients have remained resilient and tackled the challenges of the last two years. And also their drive for innovation and sustainability initiatives. We're gonna look at what the key focus is as Christmas is around the corner, as we mentioned, and everybody's getting all excited. So we will also have a little quiz at the end, a cracker quiz, as I'm gonna call it. So these guys have already prepared, had a little gift sent in the post. Um, we're also gonna have Q and A at the end if we have got time. So there is a Q and A function. So if you've got any questions to ask, it's different than the chat function that I know we've just been discussing and talking on. So if you just go to that when you're ready, if you've got a question, we'll hopefully come to that at the end. Um, so for now, I'm gonna pass on to Andrea to kick off the intros, but um, sit back, get a brew and enjoy the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having me here. So um, my name is Andrea, I'm uh, the head of portfolio at Pets at Home. Um, I've been at Pets at Home for a year now, I can't believe that it's been a year, so I've made the change during the pandemic. Um, just from a bit of background, worked in various industries um, in my um, clearly very short um, career. Um, I'm only 21. Um, so various industries, primarily in change and transformation, um, did spend quite a number of years um, actually in HR. So um, a lot of my focus throughout my career has been people, very much people focused, but over the, the last probably over six years, really got into the technology space. So really love the fact that I'm able to join that people and technology, which is, which is absolutely key. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. I'm gonna hand over to Will. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, I've been working in uh, IT and e-commerce longer than you've been alive, so I've done about 22 years now. Um, but yeah, my focus really has been, has been in e-commerce and retail uh, and technology for all of that time. Um, so yeah, worked as a consultant for a number of years for uh, implementing HL commerce and large um, platform re-implementations for some of the some big retailers in the UK. Um, and I've been at Hotter now for 12 months, uh, where my role is technology director. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Mark. I've been at the co-op for almost three years now. It doesn't feel anywhere near that long. 
Um, I, it's been a, such a great time while I've been here and certainly a time of change. Before that, um, I spent four years at Halfords uh, in the, uh, the retail sector, um, which is interesting. And a lot of my career before that was in um, the aviation sector, not always in uh, technology and change, but often about change in some way. So uh, although I, I spent three years as IT manager for Africa for British Airways, for example, which involved lots of retail activities, going off and setting up new retail shops in Rwanda and Angola and some really interesting places with, with very interesting challenges. Um, but also getting involved in, in other elements of change and, uh, and and often in sales. So, for example, after the Gulf War, I was out in Kuwait and Iraq as a sales manager for, for British Airways out there. Uh, and I did spend time working in the corporate social responsibility world um, in, uh, in in that industry as well. So lots of retail in there, but uh, all sorts of, of different types of change in, in different countries around the world. And Susie, introduce yourself before you kick off the session. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks everyone for joining today and it's great to have our speakers here. So uh, I'm Susie, I've been working with Grace for the last year now and also on assignment at Co-op Food. So kind of seen firsthand the kind of things that go into retail and the changes that have taken place over the last few years. Um, I'm also quite active in the environmental space. So uh, looking forward to hearing about the kind of green policies that are going on in our retail world. And if anyone needs any advice on shampoo bars and conditioner after this, just give me a shout. Sure. Um, <laughs> so on to uh, our questions with our lovely speakers. The last two years, as we said, have been ever changing for retail and we've seen increased sales turn to empty stores, PPE, remote working, and obviously webinars. Um, so Will, I wanted to start with you and just try and understand what is Hotter's Shoes' biggest challenge over this last two years and how have you overcome that? Yeah, so uh, I would say our biggest challenge has been the retail estate, the actual physical stores that we had. So at the start of uh, pre-COVID, we had over 80 stores. Um, as a result of COVID, the reduced footfall, having to close stores for a large period of time, uh, we made the, the tough decision to shut around 60 of our locations. So we're now down to around 23 locations. Uh, and the move has been to drive that traffic online, really. Um, so a shame to see those stores go, but fortunately from our customer base, we've actually seen a lot of those customers transfer to our online platform, um, which is which has obviously seen a lot of growth during the, the pandemic. Wow, it's great to hear that the customers have adapted to in the same way that you guys have. Um, yeah. Um, Andrea, have, have you found similar at, at Pets at Home? How's that been? Have you had to move online with a lot of your work? Yeah, we have, I suppose, um, slightly two-pronged journey for us because like everybody else, having to navigate the challenges um, with the pandemic around having to adapt all of your, you know, your your stores, the vets practices, um, the, the support offices, distribution centres. So we've had the physical sort of impact of having to adapt, but we've obviously needed to remain open um, throughout the pandemic. So, so a bit slightly different to some, some other businesses and the challenges that they've faced. So we've actually been adapting to that and the challenges of you know operating with less people and navigating those restrictions but whilst we've seen a massive growth um and increased cost to demand customer demand so i think that's been a that's been a, um, a sort of parallel challenge um it's fantastic that we have seen that that growth as a business um but what that's that's meant is that we've had to then try and sort of navigate that and to be to be honest we didn't have um a massive digital um, presence at the beginning of the um, pandemic so from a customer experience perspective so we've had to really really quickly adapt invest develop deploy and I think even more importantly adopt new technologies so whether that's the, the, the colleagues working remotely or whether that's colleagues in store because we had to very quickly sort of deploy a number of um, things like contactless collection click and collect things we didn't have beforehand um, so that's been a real challenge but um, fantastic results on the back end of that. That's great to hear that there's there's been positive attributions with all these things that have gone on um, Will, have you found you've had positive side effects of it? Yeah, definitely. We've used this as a as an opportunity, really, to sort of drive innovation in the stores as well. So, we've we've set up a um, one of our uh, key stores as almost a technology centre now, where customers that that do go in can you know have their feet measured on um, special sort of foot measuring technology called Safe Size. 
Um, we set up a pop-up store in the Trafford Centre to try and, you know, get our brand out there and um, into areas where we know, you know, we don't have a strong store presence now. So I think from our perspective, it's really about how we can adapt to the to the situation, how we can use technology to to really sort of grow that customer base, grow that revenue, uh, and we've seen some really good results. So. You know, having the pop-up in the Trafford Centre allows customers to see the brand, to measure their feet as well. We've got the safe size machines there and they get to see the products as well. And we've even taken orders in those pop-up locations as well. So starting to try and innovate really to see how far we can, you know, what customers are prepared to do. Um, if the, for example, you know, there's a concept we have at the moment of stockless stores which is which is being mooted here so if a customer can go in have a really good experience in a, in a potentially a smaller location a smaller retail uh, footprint but they can get their, their foot measured they can see all the products online they can use augmented reality which is a feature we've released during the pandemic and there's no reason then really that they can't you know pick the right products off the back of that purchase that product and have it delivered to their to their home so i think it really you know times of a in, in times of crisis like this, we, we've got to look at how we can adapt and use technology to the, you know, to the benefit of our customers. Definitely, and that's really, really interesting and uh, innovative of you guys. Um, so, Mark, I saw in the news um, recently uh, the campaign around retail workers' safety is all moving forward. Would you say that's one of the biggest challenges Co-op has focused on in the last few years? It's a really good question, Susie, and it's interesting because when we think about the last 18 months and the challenges we've had, the, the things that Sam mentioned at the beginning, so things like Brexit, things like COVID, things like issues with logistics are probably the things that are in the news at the most. Um, but there are all sorts of other things that affect us, and the safety and well-being of our colleagues is really, really important. Um, it's um, I was really surprised, shocked when I when I joined Co-op to find out the, the level of violence and the level of crime that affects uh, shops. If you imagine how, how Co-ops operate, often we're, we're the local convenience store in a particular community. Uh, we've had a, a campaign for several years now called Safer Colleagues, Safer Communities, looking at how do we work with, with people, be it the, the or, or unions, be it our local communities, be it the, uh, the local police services to say, uh, how do we ensure the safety of uh, of our uh, retail workforce? Uh, and that is looking at how we reduce crime, and it's been a it's been a really significant focus for us for the last few years uh, to make sure that happens. But it's it's also about some of the more obvious parts of um, uh, keeping our colleagues safe in the current environment. Um, COVID means that we've had PPE in shops as well. We've had uh, perspex screens that everybody's seen when they've gone into to shops. Um, and thinking about the implications of um, of what COVID means. Uh, on top of all those other things we talked about it means that we've got to make sure people are safe and they feel safe anxiety levels have gone up across the country across the world and i, I guess we all feel that when we're not quite sure what's going to happen next and, and what the future holds and, and how do you make sure your teams are, are safe and secure and we've got this dichotomy of different working conditions depending on when people are um we've got some colleagues who are required to be in a in a location where lots of other people so if you're in a shop or you're in a, a one of our logistics warehouses um you're going to be there with lots of other people and how do we make sure people stay safe and feel safe uh, as part of that how do we look at um things like long covid and the impact of that on our, on our teams but also when we've got people like me who are working from home most of the time you know once upon a time i was in the office five days a week um and probably in the office a, a day a week the, uh, these days and it sort of depends from week to week and we've moved to a hybrid working policy for for people like me how, how do we check in on people and say how are you really feeling how are our colleagues actually surviving and feeling at the moment once upon a time you could walk around the office and you could say i'm not sure that person's really feeling it at the moment i, I just want to go and check they're okay if you're spending all your time on a zoom call with someone and they've got their camera off and they're, they're telling you that you, you um that they're okay what do you do about that so we've done a lot of work as well in making sure people have those support services that have those, that well-being wrapper around them ha having the the, the helplines they can call anonymously to say do you know what i'm, I'm actually struggling at the moment uh, we've also done a lot of work as well on, on helping people with uh, the, the various planning and the, the changes that are going on. What does it look for their financial welfare? You know, what does, how do they look after the mental health in the current environment? Yeah, that's, that's brilliant work. And I think one thing everyone on this call will be able to relate with is kind of that being behind the screen and, and needing that personal connection. So um, yeah, well done to, I know a lot of different retail companies have been working in that, um, in those campaign spaces, but well done to everyone who's been involved in that. So the festive season is fast approaching. As we all know, there are Christmas trees popping up all over the UK. Um, and 
One of the favourite gifts for children, I think, at Christmas is definitely pets. I know that in my house as a kid, I had six guinea pigs, 10 rabbits that had lots of more rabbits all the time, uh, hamsters, dog, look, anything you could name it. And um, we got all of those from pets at home. So, uh, Andrea, how do you prepare for the, the Christmas rush of children collecting all the, all the pets they can get? Well, it's obviously I think everybody's aware how how significant there's been such an increase in pet ownership um, throughout the pandemic. Um, so leading into the festive period um, is obviously one of our busiest times. Um, so we and, and I think Sam alluded to some of this this um, before. We've you know everybody's suffering with the supply chain challenges. So around uh, stock availability. Um, our teams behind the scenes have been looking at all sorts of different ways in which we can make sure we protect availability. Um, we've had the we are also impacted by the labour market challenges. Um, so making sure we're, we're uh, we've got that increased sort of flexibility, and we're, we're looking at retention bonuses and um, you know all of that sort of stuff. So we also, and, and again, I referenced it before around being digitally ready. So we've got to make sure we're convenient for our customers, but also we've got to be able to navigate, um, and again, everybody will be in the same position, navigate the changing government guidelines that potentially can just happen at any at any time. So that, that um, our people have to be at the forefront um, of, of our service, but also we need to be digitally ready. So making sure we're able to, we've done a couple of new initiatives recently. So we've got Click and Collect now. We sort of launched that early on in the pandemic, but things like delivering um, st stock from store. So where some of the orders that are coming in through our online channels, we can fulfill through our stores as opposed to our distribution network. So it alleviates some of the, the the strain on that so that's that's been a really it's, it's a more recent sort of capability we've put in that's been um really key um and also sort of uh, supporting accessibility um so this sort of we can come and put stuff into your car you don't even need to come into the store so making sure we're digitally ready and digitally enabled is is fantastic but we can't forget that one of our values is we have fun so we do not need to do forced fun at pets at home. I can tell you that now. I've been been there a year, and there is absolutely the colleagues just drive the fun themselves. So there's loads and loads of um, festive activities going on. That's in stores, in the practices, in the distribution centres. I think one of the, one of the managers was saying the um, in the DCs the the managers are serving Christmas dinner to the colleagues, which I'm sure they'll love that. Um, you know, advent calendars, quiz, quizzes, and stuff, but. Although we know we're focused on this, been our, there's loads of efforts gone in to make sure we've got stock availability, you know, we're prepared, everything else. But one of, we were one of the first businesses to, to announce that we're going to close our stores on Boxing Day. So although it's our peak period and we'll make sure we put all of that wraparound support, you know, giving that back to our colleagues so they've got extra time to spend with their families at home, I think really stands out for me. And, and I want to just make sure that, so that, that was called out as well because that's, that for me is really important and it, and it really, really sort of lives our values as an organisation as well, no matter how busy we are. That's an absolutely wonderful thing to do. And I think especially after, you know, the years, two years that everyone's have, we appreciate even more those times that we can get with our friends and family. So I'm sure yeah, uh, all your workers at Pets at Home are, are massively appreciative. Um, so Will, obviously Andrea's just talked about 20 different things yeah. that incorporate, you know, the, the kind of things you guys have to think about when it comes to this period. And it can be a really stressful time for the retail workers. Um, do you have any top tips on kind of keeping colleague morale up at Hotter Shoes? So really just to echo Andrew's point, really, it's having, it's it's remaining to have fun in, in the office. You know, we still, we, we're in that hybrid working situation as well, which makes it really difficult. Some people are only in a couple of days a week. So, um, you know, unfortunately our Christmas party was cancelled because we actually work with alongside our own factory. So the, you know, our offices are wrapped around the factory. If we, if we had a COVID outbreak, then, you know, that would pretty much shut our business down. So we've had to be really careful and really cautious. And we've actually started to, you know, consider and prepare for a, for another lockdown. And what would that mean? So really, this this period of time has been one of caution. 
um, and that's partly because of the makeup of our business, but also, you know, still still have some fun. We still have an interdepartmental meals and dinners to, you know, just to say thanks to the staff for all the hard work they've done throughout the year. Um, but yeah, it's particularly challenging for us with with COVID. Um, you know, with people not being in the office, but we are going to have a few days where hopefully everybody comes in the office. We do the Christmas quizzes. Um, I think we've got some decoration uh, competitions for people's desks, etc. So we're, we're just doing lots of little things just to keep people entertained uh, throughout throughout this uh, probably miserable time of year, really, with the, with the weather <laughs> as it is at the moment. <laughs> well, hopefully it won't be a miserable time of year when you all manage to get together, and I hope that that's lovely yeah, yeah. for you. Um, so come to you then, Mark. At Coop, do you have any kind of festive traditions to keep the colleagues smiling? I, um, I have heard that you like to dress up in outfits quite a lot, so I'd be surprised <laughs> if you weren't um, coming on in a Santa costume at some point. Susie, my Santa costume is just outside arm's reach. If I could, if my arm was about a foot longer, I'd be able to, to reach over for it just there. So I have been known to turn up at Santa all sorts of uh, all sorts of events, not just co-op ones. Uh, supporting some local charities has been their their Santa, uh, and my beard slowly turning the right colour. That means I, I can stop dyeing it in the uh, in the not too distant future. But yeah, no, absolutely, and a, a bit like what Will and Andrea have said. There's a series of traditions that we normally have. Well, we have the usual Christmas parties and things like that, but we're just not going to have in the same way uh, this year. And it's making sure people feel comfortable with what that uh, what that looks like and we're uh, making sure we're following the uh, the guidance and the rules in, in each of the different parts of the UK that we operate um, and, and those do change and, and vary and, and make sure that people are staying safe and it's a really interesting time of the year because you know our shops are really busy or distribution centres are really busy because we buy different things at Christmas and it's sometimes we, we buy more things than, than we would normally buy I would imagine most people buy more Brussels sprouts at Christmas than, than through most of the rest of the year uh, and there'll be other things like turkeys that, that sell a lot this time. And of course, we have lines that are in shops at this time of the year that we, we wouldn't have at other times. So, uh, you know, it might be our, our Christmas dinner spring rolls, um, which you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see in our shops, which, uh, which are, um, you know, interesting and, and, and certainly worth uh, trying or pigs and blankets uh, crisps, which are, which are delicious, actually. They're really good. So there's a whole series of different items of stock that are there. One of the traditions that we're continuing this year is getting uh, people like me who, who don't work in a shop or in a warehouse into our shops, into our warehouses, uh, in, into our funeral homes and, and adding uh, some value there over the Christmas busy period. Um, so in a couple of weeks time, you'll find me spending a day stacking shelves in a in a shop near me um, in uh, here in the in the middle. And so you know, it's, it's, it's really useful to do that because you get that connection about what our colleagues are doing. You're adding some real value by going in and, and, and spending some time with them. Um, and you're finding out what's really important to them because sometimes it can be really easy to feel a bit detached about what's going on on, on the um in, in the shops and, and actually being able to to go off and experience it ourselves is really important and, and it's worth thinking too about uh, making sure that people do have that festive time that they can and remembering that we're a reflection of the communities that we serve and lots of the communities that we serve will have loads of people who aren't going to have a festive jolly time at christmas because of everything that's going on through the the last year um, if anyone saw our Christmas advert this year, it was um, a couple of weeks ago on the, on the Friday, we had a, 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 a live advert going out in the middle of Coronation Street. Uh, and we had Dermot O'Leary and Big Zoo, um, who, who you might be familiar with. Uh, and they've gone into the Afghan and Central Asian Association in Felton, looking at one of the community fridges that we support, seeing how we can help develop that, that community spirit in places, make sure those community meals are, are served and people have that ability to have somewhere to go to get some uh, good nutritious food. Um, and we're uh, we're working with all sorts of organisations across the country to have those community fridges available for people. You know, it's it's really important. The co-op was founded um, 177 years ago to 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 not just sell things, but to to be a force for positive change. And it's great to see that that's still really important in making sure we're supporting those communities that we serve. That's brilliant. And I think yeah, it, it's something we all need to remember a little bit inside or out of work that you know not everybody has the same family or friend network to go and spend Christmas with all the same you know food on their table um, I don't know if I'll have spring rolls on my Christmas dinner but you know I think it really really matters to reach out to people this time of year and make sure we're all kind of putting our arms around each other aren't we so um, there's been all sorts of innovation across retail over the last few years you know moving into uh automatic uh, robots all that kind of stuff that's going on so what do you guys if you could get your crystal ball out right now what would you see coming next for retail will do you want to go 
Yeah, yeah, I can go first. So, so, so for me, and it's an area that we're looking at as well. It's it's all around payments and making um, that payment journey, you know, simpler for the customer. So, we've seen a lot in the press recently about the likes of Klarna, Layby, ClearPay. Uh, and all those different options, but I think that's that's just going to continue to grow. We're we're more used to contactless payment now. So you know, two or three years ago, you know, sort of cash was still was still dominant. I think again, as a result of the pandemic, we've increased the payment limits uh, that you can do for con- contactless payments up to 100 pounds. Our average order is less than that, so the majority of our customers now can come in and and can you know we'll we'll soon be able to use contactless payment. Um, so I, th- I think really that payment area, and I think the innovation will come from those some of those companies as well. So the likes of whether it's Layby or Klarna, you know, they're having their own digital wallets, so they're almost having their own customer bases and people who use their products. So yeah, for me that is um, that's one significant area of change that I think we're going to see digitally, but also in the physical retail stores as well. And um, Mark, have you got? I know that um, co-op kind of moved to a lot of online uh, innovative things. So what do you see coming next within retail? Yeah, it's, it's a really, a really good point. And I, I guess you think about how we shop, that's that's changed. So a lot of your grocery shopping, uh, when online delivery started, you'd have one big shop that would come probably once a week with your, your big shop. We're, we're getting more orders for, and we, we've got a, a service now in, in, in certain areas where we deliver um, the, the convenience food. So you, you get those orders delivered by either an electric vehicle or, or by a partner um, out to have that as sort of more immediate uh, need. Uh, really interestingly, we have um, um, a fleet of robots in, in Milton Keynes who deliver for us. So if you live in Milton Keynes, you might have seen the, the Starship robots um, that, that go out and deliver to, to people's houses. Um, their, their immediate orders and um, just seeing how that's going to expand and you know these technologies that 10 15 years ago they felt like something from science fiction they're actually out and being used at the moment um but that's uh, there's, there's definitely going to be a, a lot of progress i think in in that area making sure that that shopping is convenient i think one of the other areas though where innovation is is going to be a big thing is thinking about how we innovate for the environment um, and how we use innovation to, to drive sustainability. We, we've done a lot on, on packaging, for example, uh, in recent years, and, and to continue to do that. And it's really interesting how some of the innovation can be relatively straightforward uh, and can make a massive difference. So, um, you know, a few years ago, we we took out the polystyrene pizza bases that we had and moved to a cardboard pizza base that's um, that's recyclable. So that takes 200 tonnes of polystyrene out of the uh, the landfill need. Uh, and there, there are a load of um, recycling uh, things like that or compostable uh, carrier bags, for example, um, that uh, they are out there changing the sort of pots that our mushrooms come in. Uh, th- there's a, continu- a required continuation of that to make sure that our, our footprint on the planet is as small as we can make it uh, and that we're, we're being good stewards for the, uh, for the planet for, and, and looking after what we need for all of us to survive. Wow. Yeah, robots in stores, um, it's really interesting. I mean, we've we've got stores that don't even have uh, people at the checkouts anymore, do we? You know, the Amazon stores and things like that. And it's it's yeah. um, strange to think what might be coming. So, Andrea, have you got any robots coming behind the Pets at Home till soon? or Not that I'm aware of, if I'm honest. Um, but I think I can't really say much more than um, what Mark and Will have just covered off. I think um, digitally that we've probably most organizations have been have been pushed to just accelerate their their, their digital agendas and therefore um, had had a lot of investment in that and I think um, everybody's looking just constantly looking ahead at the what next the what next the what next I think from from our perspective we're definitely it's, it's all around that connected omni-channel experience because we've got um, and and this will be this will be um, similar in other organisations. We've got fantastic experts, um, and and you know a lot of our customers still want to come into store and talk to those experts. But it's about having that channel, but also building channels like um, you know you can go on our website and um, Pet, Pet Expert Live, I think it's called. You can go onto our website. You can then um, connect to an expert in store. So actually, you don't have to physically go in store, but they can. You know, if you've got a more complex purchase, you want to. You want to. So you can. They can actually go and do that with you and, and have that interaction um, without being physically in the store. So I think um, another factor, but again, it's not necessarily new, but constantly building on it is all the artificial intelligence. What we do with our data. Um, so again, data is is king. Um, so you know, 
what are all the ways and and, and the the smarter ways we can we can leverage those things and optimize those things in the future as well so not sure about robots um i saw a question coming through around driverless trucks frightens me to death um the thought of that um but yeah all of these things are, 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 are clearly you know longer term strategies um, it's always going to be about what's the next thing that's going to make um, efficiencies put back into the environment, as Mark mentioned, you know, all of those things. So um, all, all fair points, just not not expecting a robot behind a pets at home um, counter at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I've even I've even tweeted uh, Andrea um, Pets at Home about the wonderful service I've had before, and I've gone in to ask questions about uh, about my dogs. And you know, what, one of the one of the Christmas activities at the minute is buying my dogs Christmas presents. I do have two very spoiled um, <laughs> rescue dogs, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's great to go in and, and talk to people who know what they're talking about. It makes a massive difference. The so, the so um, it's unbelievable. Obviously, like I said, I've only been at pets at home a year myself, and it absolutely fascinates me still. Um, somebody was talking to me just the other day um, when we was doing a um, an engagement session around um, somebody who absolutely knows everything about reptiles, a reptile expert, like knows everything about everything. So it's you know you've not to lose that. Um, you can have as much technology as, as you want. I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm you know huge on people and technology and those things have to come together so we we you know we invest in our digital agenda but our people remain and, and our experts remain so yeah i think those are really great points about you know keeping that human connection whilst we've got all this you know what feels like a lot of acceleration behind moving forward so thank you guys for sharing that um, and Mark already touched a little bit on this, but as we're aware, you know, the UK has got some climate targets and it's on the radar with COP26. Um, this is something that Grace is incredibly passionate about as well. You know, we've got our sustainability initiative and a lot of people within the Grace business that are, that are driving our um, climate values. So other than the, the polystyrene in the pizza, Mark, what kind of, do you feel the eco spirit running through co-op? Oh, hugely, hugely, and you know, you'd have seen some of the activity at at, um, at uh, COP26, where some of our stores where we became the COP26 around uh, around Glasgow when, when when COP26 was on. I mean, I mentioned earlier that the environment and sustainability is, is something that's weaved through COP for a very, very long time, and and to be honest, it's one of the reasons why I'm at COP. You mentioned um, the the sustainable shampoos and the like uh, uh, earlier, Susie. Probably not quite as useful for me, but certainly something that you know it's been on yeah. my mind for a long time. And you know, um, way back in the in the eighties, um, you know, even then I was involved in in doing um, work and setting up sustainability groups when I was at school. It's very end of the eighties, I'd like to point out, but uh, you know, a long time ago. And the co-op has uh, at its heart that, that this look at sustainability. We have a ten point action plan, um, which is really important for us to look at how we drive that sustainability. And, and that comes in different ways. So there's short-term and long-term goals in there, how we, how we become carbon neutral and how, how we work on that. Looking at how we can really quickly um, uh, decarbonize the work that we do uh, and how we compensate for the environment with by by making sure that we're looking at renewables and doing something with that. It's really important that we provide our customers with low carbon options that are easy to choose. Um, and those are everything from, from some of the items I mentioned, you know, and it's, there's loads of innovation around that about changing the type of plastic that's in the milk carton pop to make them easier to recycle. There, there, there are loads and loads of changes happening all the time on that um, through to making sure our, our plant-based food range grow is priced in the same way as a meat equivalent product would be uh, would, would be priced. And I find myself eating more and more plant-based products as, uh, as part of that. Uh, we're making sure we're directing our finance towards uh, a reduced carbon environment. So where do we invest our pensions and the likes? And how do we make sure we're doing the best thing for them? We, we work with our suppliers to make sure our suppliers can benefit from, from that as well. And uh, we've been involved in the fair trade movement right from the early days of of fair trade to make sure that that flows through our, our supply chain and the people because you know the sustainability is about the sustainability of the people as, as well as the planet that that flows through to the people who provide us with the goods that um that, that we sell and um, we we campaign for climate change we talked earlier about our campaigns for safer colleagues and safer communities we also campaign on on climate change to make sure we're doing the right thing there um, and, and how do we work with third parties, making sure we're cooperating with people uh, to drive some of that change? Uh, and it's not just us doing it. It's, it's in all our interests to make things better. 
Um, and it's, it's got to be really important that climate is a priority for us. So our food CEO's pay is, is linked to our performance on, uh, on sustainability. So that's really, really important. Uh, you know, we've done things like introducing uh, soft plastic recycling in shops. So it doesn't have to be soft um, plastics that come from co-op. You can bring other retailers soft plastics to us that can be hard to recycle uh, in, in various areas when, it, when it's picked up by local councils. And we'll recycle it for you because it, it helps everyone. You know, we're, we're called the cooperative and uh, we, we need to cooperate to make the world better for all of us. That's brilliant. So much going on in that space. Um, so, Will... I've seen some bits around recently on recycling your old shoe soles, um, but do tell me, how can you make shoes more environmentally friendly? Yeah, definitely. It's quite, it's quite hard to follow Mark on a, on a subject like that, I think. But <laughs> the, the advantage that we have is we're in control of our own manufacturing. So whether that's you know where the goods come from and, and how they're brought in and where they're manufactured to make sure that the that the factories that produce some of the materials that go into our shoes are doing so in an environmental way so that they're not polluting local rivers or having lots of wastage and there's there's, there's groups that we're signed up to to make sure that that doesn't happen so all our tanneries for example are gold standard and as part of that gold standard it's not just about the quality of the leather that goes into our products it's about the wastage that comes from those factories and they've got standards that they have to adhere to to meet those to become a gold level um, supplier. So there's the stuff that happens before the raw materials get to us and then it's deciding what materials that we put in it. So in our soles, for example, we use a lot of recycled rubber in the soles of our product, uh, organic cotton, uh, we're recycling, you know, we use shoe boxes that can be recycled and we also have a lot of returns that come in. So we make sure we recycle that waste as well. Um, so there's a lot in our production process and the manufacturing process that that we're continually improving and um, to make it better all the time. And what, what's really clear when you walk around our factory is actually how efficient it's becoming. So there was a lot of wastage. If you think about production, you know, making making products and creating seconds, actually by creating really good process in the factory, reducing that wastage, you know, the, the knock on effect is it's, it's naturally becomes more environmentally friendly because you're not throwing away products which you know, think about manufacturing lots of different areas you know we do throw we have a lot of wastage so that's something that we're really focused on at hotter and, and a lot of the team have been trained in in six sigma to make sure we've got the most efficient processes um another thing really it's about um it's again how can you use technology to to sort of in, you know reduce carbon footprint um you know we've we've reduced our our stores you know people traveling less using less you know carbon if they don't have to go to a store are we providing the same service online so whether it's as andrea mentioned video technology or is it you know we've recently launched the recently launched the feature called true fit which is uh, using artificial intelligence to give people the right you know the right shoe size so um they can order with confidence and it reduces returns rates again so there's less you know co2 being produced as a result of that so there's so many things we can do from a manufacturing perspective, but also I think from a technology perspective as well. So, yeah, we're we're working hard to do it. It's it's just an ongoing uh, initiative, you know, for, for us as it is with everybody. That's really really interesting, and you know, things I wouldn't even have thought about all the different supply chain parts. And I know that returning, um, you know, products from retail is a huge carbon emission. So yeah, great work in that space. Um, Andrea, then, do pets at home have, I'm sure you do, well, you know, what are the pets at home aims for going greener? Uh, so, um, so we've obviously, like probably everybody else, we've got our social value strategy. Um, and as part of that, we've got our vision. So that's for us to be um, the most responsible pet care business in the world. So a little bit ambitious. Um, and sort of to support that, we've got our better world world pledge and you can speak to probably any colleague in the organization and they'll they'll reference the better um, our better world pledge so that's made up of three pillars so that's about pets people and planet so that's really sort of a, a real um, important factor for us um so we there's a lot of commitments in there if anybody ever wants to go and have a look at it it's out there you can go and have a read um but you know we've got the commitments to you know there being net zero carbon operationally by 2030 um net zero value chain by 2040 so those big commitments but there's also things like where we've um extended our um 
our partnership with the Woodland Trust. So again, I love how we, we sort of link the, the pets and, and the planet together. So um, as part of a pet memory scheme, so when um, so Vets Practices will donate every time, a, a, sadly, a, a pet passes, and that adds to the creation um, and restoration of over 20,000 acres of woodland. So again, that's capturing sort of 5,000 tonnes of carbon each year. So it's it's those sort of, sort of initiatives. So that's, that's just one, and you know we're doing similar to what Mark mentioned around piloting um sort of recycling things like the, the flexible plastics so we we have very pe popular pet food pouches um so making sure that we've we've got we're looking at and exploring ways in which we can contribute to make sure we're, we're um we're doing things better in, in in them instances but one thing i would also call out because i think um it's really important so it's, it's one thing making the commitments but it it, it the, our sort of strategy really outlines how we're going to govern it um, and how we're going to be held to account for our commitments and um, within it within the um, better world pledge sort of commitments there's a really sort of clear outline of that and i think that's really important for organizations make commitments but how are you going to sort of manage that and make sure you, you're living up to those commitments so um i think i think that's a that's a key point too yeah, it's a brilliant point. And I love that um, pets, people and planet. That, that's definitely a value to live by, isn't it? So thank you for sharing that. Um, it, it's been amazing to hear all the work that you guys are doing. And thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, I'm going to just pass back over to Sam now. I think she's got some exciting festive gifts for you guys to open. Thank you. Thanks, Susie, for that. And absolutely brilliant kind of output from all of you on that and insight into what's going on in each of your uh, in each of your companies it's just amazing so hopefully you've all received in the post a little gift from us at grace and i'm going to go around asking you to pull your cracker ask the question within the cracker and then hopefully on screen we should see a little poll and anybody that is listening in now and hopefully um you've learned a huge amount today anyway but let's see if you can guess the answers to these questions so mark first do you want to pull your cracker please it feels very odd pulling a cracker by myself <laughs> <laughs> can i just say they're all sustainable as well actually have <laughs> I'm nervous about pulling this cracker I have to say because you, you just know it's going to be carnage I think <laughs> that did very well then well well, most, most importantly but there is of course a hat. <laughs> and I'm, I'm gutted I've not got one here it, it fits my it fits my head pretty much uh, uh, as well so I, I have a very a very neatly written message which is uh um, which, uh, whoever has written it should be uh, uh, doing calligraphy um so the, the question i've got to ask everybody uh watching is roughly how many mince pies are eaten nationally each year roughly how many mince pies are eaten nationally each year and we've got three choices that uh, have appeared so we've got 62.2 million 800 million or one billion. Right, let's find out. Has everybody put the guess on? Right, okay, so the biggest guess there is 800 million. And that's the right answer. Well done. <laughs> so that is an amazing amount of mince pies. And I think I've probably hit the million pound, uh, million mark already, just me. And uh, there's a few in the kitchen in this uh, room as well. Okay, that's, more than, that's more than 10 per person. That's ridiculous, isn't it? I've definitely eaten more than 10 now. <laughs> I think I've already got to my 10 this year. <laughs> I have as well. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Uh, Andrea, would you like to pull your cracker? I, I, I will. <laughs> oh, it didn't. It didn't. It pop. I just think that is sort of bad luck, that. Okay, let me, let me see. I feel, I feel like I have to... Um, Put my hat on as well now thanks mark for that found my hat found my question um okay so as i'm putting my hat on let me see if this doesn't fit my head now i'm going to be really embarrassed mark <laughs> there you go you look like oh you're perfect fit. perfect perfect okay so what was pets at home's biggest seller last christmas Okay, so we've got three choices. We've got dog advent calendars, a sprout dog toy, and Dreamy's variety cat treat Christmas stocking. And I've got to say, I've got all three at my house, which is 
I feel like I want to see what this sprout dog toy looks like. <laughs> I've got one, I'll show you it. <laughs> okay, right, we're going to get the results. So, ooh, it's pretty close. So we're going between the sprout dog toy and dog advent calendars here. Um, and the answer is dog advent calendar. <laughs> Well done. I think at the moment, so far, that was 44% guess that against 40% for the sprouts. So we're getting it right, guys, which is really, really good. The sprouts are popular as well, though, to be fair. Are they? Are these, they're the ones with squeaking, because I've got a squeaky one at home. Yeah, I think I think that, yeah, and they just get better every year. I think, I think yeah, interesting. Well, as, as I've got 10 mince pies, I've also got three dog advent calendars and only one dog, so, yeah. Even the so... <laughs> Oh, brilliant. And over to Will now, no pressure, but there you go. <laughs> oh, not popped it either. There we go. Right. My question is. You've got to put your hat on. I was just going to say, Will, where's your hat? Where's your hat? I mean. Oh, I didn't get one. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay, <a> bit, okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Good blame Mark for this. There you go. <laughs> Completely. I, I, I'll take all the blame for uh, any random hat wearing that's required. <laughs> uh, at Hotter Shoes HQ, how far in advance does preparation start for Black Friday? Oh. Okay, and your choices are one month before it. So just to remind you, Black Friday was at the end of November this year, wasn't it? Uh, three months before it or six months before? Hmm. Ooh, so we've got a big uh, big lead here. We've got 74%, say six months prior. And what is the answer, Will? Do you know? Do I know? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct, six months prior. Uh, everyone knows. Everyone's in retail, aren't they? they <laughs> that was an easy question. So there's, there's a lot goes into it, and I think people don't realise, do they, for what that seems to be one day. Yeah, it's a bit like Christmas, isn't it? So much goes into that run-up. So, uh, yeah, brilliant. Did you have a successful one this year? We, we did, we did. Um, we were above the market average and we also beat last year's sales as well. So it, it's been a good year for Hotter. Oh, that is brilliant. And thank you guys. We have got 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask you some questions that have come in through the Q&A. Um, some brilliant chat and questions coming through. I'm just going to pick three of them, I think, now. So um, Callum's written in and said, how did your company, I'm going to pick one person, by the way, for each question. How did your company react to the increased online demand from a logistics perspective when retail stores closed, i.e. were warehouses set up to deal with the increased online offering or were new projects spun up to develop capabilities? I think given that, I think, Will, you mentioned store closures. Can you answer that? Did you change the way of, of your logistics? Yeah, well, so so first off, it's, it's a really good question and, and the biggest challenge for us actually is we had a a lot of stores out there with a lot of physical stock in those stores and actually that's that's once those stores are locked down we didn't have access to it so if you think about a shoe store with all the variations of a particular size you know we could have you know thousands of items in a store that if they remained in that store we couldn't sell so what we had to do is had a um, you know, a, quite a big logistics operation to retrieve all the stock from the stores during lockdown and to bring them back to our to our warehouse. So yeah, we absolutely had to adapt. We had to, you know, enable the customers to be able to purchase those products. So a big project, yes, to bring all those goods back into the warehouse. Fortunately, we had we had warehouse space, so we we're able to bring those goods in because we can control the level of products that we're manufacturing as well with our warehouse sitting on the back of our um, of our factory as well. So very very difficult time um but in order to keep the volumes of stock up to make sure that we could satisfy the customer needs and uh, yeah we had a lot of work to do Brilliant. thank you it's fascinating actually seeing what what goes on behind the scenes that you don't realize as a consumer um yeah. we've got a question from russell here saying what's the number one piece of learning from recent challenges so i am actually going to ask andrea that one Thanks, Sam. Um, and yeah, thanks, Russell, as well. Um, so it's a really good question. So much learning. Um, I think, personally, it's got to be that um, we, 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 we've always been very um, 
if you think about we talk about change people are always like oh people don't like change oh you know we're not, we're not sure about change and you have to really sort of think about you of course you do have to think about it when you when you the amount of how quickly pe people have adapted and how quickly we've accelerated and introduced sort of really significant changes into our organizations um in a, in a previous role that um i was doing prior to the the pandemic um it was all about looking at digital workplace and I, and I seriously think I'd have probably took eight years to convince people of some of the things that we we were wanting to introduce and we've just all adapted to this with everybody of all of all age groups you know all different sort of backgrounds have, have adapted yeah and, and yes it's been hard but I think the biggest learning has been around how people can come together and people can adapt and we can adapt as organizations um it you know it's it's not gone without its absolute significant challenges but i think the big the biggest learning for me is um seeing how we've done that and how we can maybe replicate that removing some of maybe the stresses and and pressures that we've had to encounter to do it because we've we've had that um association but certainly that how how we can adapt as organizations and as people yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And Mark, I'm going to ask you the, uh, I've got one more question that I'm going to go to all of you on, but just a question directly to you, Mark. How important are partnerships to your business going forward? Uh, incredibly. I mean, we're called the cooperative and, uh, you know, our, our vision is cooperating for a fairer world because it is about partnership and it's about us all working in, in partnership to to not, not just to, for, for the purposes of retail, but to drive the positive change that uh, that we need in the society around us. You know, um, we we um, we're we're very driven by partnerships. Um, you know, it's 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 very much it's what we do. Um, looking at how we partner with other organisations to uh, to drive that right type of change. Yeah. And that's the strap line of the cops, isn't it? It's what we do. <laughs> what we <laughs> do. <laughs> so my final question before we wrap up, and I thoroughly enjoyed this last hour. I can't believe I was blown by. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask each of you, um, what have you appreciated most about your people throughout these challenges of the last couple of years? So if I go to Will first, then Andrea, then Mark, and then we'll finish. So Will, what have you appreciated most about your people? I think um, the flexibility and honesty that they've shown throughout you know, this period of time. So the fact that we've asked people to really change their lifestyles and change how they work uh, almost overnight. Um, and people have adapted to it, you know, immediately. Obviously, I'm, I'm sat in our, in our IT department now. The, the additional work that they've had to do to set this up, you know, to make sure our people in our contact centre who were unable to come into the offices um, were able to work from home and still continue to work during this period and support not only themselves, their family, but also our customers. Um, so really, it's that flexibility that, that the staff has shown and that willingness to sort of go above and beyond really to to make sure the business can can still run um uh, it's been some really challenging times we've had to furlough people especially on the retail estate but you know it, it's uh it's it's hopefully coming back to back to normality now and but but it has left a a sort of lasting mark on it because we all work differently now within literally 18 months we've we've completely changed how we work you know we we're on the whole in the office two or three days a week now um so i think the you know the staff have been incredibly flexible incredibly honest and trustworthy in terms of working from home that was always people's concern i think for some reason that if someone's working from home they're not working you know hard enough are they doing the job but actually you know people are working even harder i think now um you know when, when they're doing that so you know just um just been really good to see that sort of flexibility um, across the workforce. Andrea, do you want to? Yeah, um, I think we'll covered a lot of um, key points there. Thanks, Will. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going, I'm going to sort of call out the, um, I think, resilience of, of the teams has been just immense, but also the empathy that everybody's shown all the way from, from leadership. Um, I think we're really fortunate, as, as I'm sure, sure the guys also um, can echo for their organisations, but our, our CEO, right from the very top, um, we he, he's really, really clear and it, and, it, and it absolutely cascades down. It's not about what we're doing, it's as important how we do it. So we everybody talks about behaviours in their organisations, but I am 
just so proud of, of working for pets at home because we have what we call the crisp behaviors which is quite funny because i've got chris in my team so i can mock him a little bit with that and um, we have the crisp behaviors so you know saying about being courageous honest respectful inspiring supporting and i've seen all of that I'm joining a, a new organization myself as a leader and then growing the team significantly throughout the, the year, over 50% the team has grown by. Um, I've seen everybody, existing colleagues, new colleagues, just demonstrating day in and day out all of those behaviours. They're not just written down on something. I just see it in everything that they do, but definitely resilience and, and empathy. I've, I've definitely seen, um, I've valued that massively with, with my teams and I've seen it across the board. Fantastic. And, and Mark, to you? Well, echo everything that Will and Andre have said, you know, and, and lots, of, lots of really good points there. I, I guess sort of growing on that, that, that sense of community and, and the idea that it's all our responsibility to look after each other. You know, it's, it's this weird world where lots of us are working from home. And, and once upon a time, the, the person that we knew in the office was, was a person who was contained in the office for eight hours a day. Now we're staring into people's kitchens and back bedrooms every day. Now we're meeting their pets. The, 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 you know, my, my Dalmatian, who might be more of a customer of, uh, of Andrea, will appear in the odd call of mine no matter how much I try and keep them downstairs. And, and, and we get to know people in different ways. I've got to know some of my colleagues' children and, and, and all sorts over the, um, the last two years. Uh, and, and that sense of community also fosters that, that ability to think about each other. So it's not just the, the leader of the group who's saying, I just want to check that person's okay. It's people checking in on each other. It's people yeah. looking after each other. It's people taking initiative to go off and, and, and look after other colleagues that they've got around them. And that's not just the people who work in the same environment as them. It's people going in and saying to, to our local shops, hey, I, I, I work in, uh, in Corpus, well, can I do anything to help? Um, and, and there's been so much, uh, so much more of that over the last 18 months. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's brought out the, the best in humanity in many ways. And we hear all the, the horrible news stories about all the bad things that are going on in the world around us. But, you know, my reflection is there are a lot of people who really care about each other. I agree. And I think, you know, listening to everything today and, you know, we start stuff calling this resilient retail. I think what we found from listening to the three of you today is Retail has been resilient, but a lot of that, that is down to the people and the resilience that our people have shown across the board. Um, so thank you for your insights. Really um, good to hear that every single organisation, you know, from shoes to pets to, to food stores is looking at sustainability and really caring for the environment. I love the pets, people, planet. I think that I think we'll all take that away and actually live by that and uh, I think you've answered yes retail can be resilient and you're you guys are showing that and uh, thank you for your support and thank you for coming today um, and thank you for everybody for your great questions as well so uh, we'll leave it at that say thank you have a lovely Christmas have a festive um, few weeks now on the run up to it and uh, wish you every success all of you thank you Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.